Welcome everyone to session 2B, Pandemic Lessons Learned, Taking Research and Lab Activities Online. I'm Dave McLaughlin, I, I'm Associate Dis Instructional Designer uh, with OTDI, um, playing host today in this session and just trying to troubleshoot any sort of tech difficulties that might uh, emerge, hopefully they don't. Um, and okay, thanks Stephanie. Uh, I'll turn it over to the panels. All right, uh, we will start with uh, bridging the divide through undergraduate research approaches to student center online research courses and virtual labs. So my name is Zeynep Bandarloğlu. I am an instructor in the Department of Evolution, uh, Ecology and Organismal Biology at Ohio State. I am currently overseeing the undergraduate research lab where I design and teach courses that aim to provide research opportunities for undergraduates. Our lab has typically employed hands-on in-person research before the pandemic. During the pandemic, we transformed our activities into more online data analytic and teaching tools and themes that are of global, national, and personal interest. For example, we offered a new online course on infectious diseases. We launched new research themes on in-group and out-group uh, behavior in human and non-human animals. This was due to the growing social unrest following the George Floyd protests and rise in global awareness and subsequent counter protests in matters related to immigration, race, and social justice. And together with the Office of Distance Education in Arts and Sciences, we design asynchronous virtual labs utilizing an interactive software, which is H5P, which we would like to introduce to the audience during this panel. Our team consists of undergraduate students who have gone through the newly designed uh, research courses, both as students and as TAs and peer mentors. This will be Fauna and Eleanor and uh, an instructional designer from the Office of Distance Education in Arts and Sciences, Je that will be Jessica and myself. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor or the camera to uh, Fauna. Hi, so my name is Fauna Whitesell. I am an undergraduate student under the EEOB department at Ohio State. I've worked with Dr. Z as a student in her research classes and also as a TA for her U research lab. I've spent kind of my undergraduate years in the peak of the pandemic, watching it transfer from, you know, normal times before COVID to during the pandemic where it was online to back in person again. Um, it's still something that was a very interesting experience and definitely really impacted my college experience. During the pandemic, we also saw a lot of social unrest. For example, there was the George Floyd case and also the pandemic itself highlighted a lot of the social inequity present in our medical system and our society and things such as that. In higher education, we are producing the next generation of scientists, doctors, policymakers, social workers, and educators who will all be directly influencing social issues. However, there's often this disconnect where higher education and the larger communities affecting aren't always necessarily aligned and prioritizing these social issues. Many general education classes or major specific classes fail to highlight these issues and only focus on, you know, if you're teaching math, just focusing on math. Um, Dr. Z's 3494 undergraduate research class intertwined ecology and the root causes of racial and social biases by exploring an us versus them theme. For the class, we would be assigned a study to read. We would then research related studies and discuss our findings among each other as a class. For example, we learned about like naked mole rats and their ability to form local dialects and even violently expel outsiders who don't speak these dialects, almost like humans when we are kind of weird about foreign accents or things like that. You're seeing these in <laughs> the actual little mole rats. Um, another reading discussed elephants' ability to detect gender and ethnicity of humans. So the elephants in the study were shown stimuli from different groups of tribes. Some of these tribes hunted them, some of them didn't. And the tribes that hunted them, they were a lot more negatively reactive towards. Um, and, you know, we kind of saw this ability across all sorts of species from even like fish to respond differently to outsiders. And that was really fascinating for me. I had already learned about like in and out groups and human psychology, but this was the first time really diving in and exploring them in non-human animals. 
Uh, kind of as a discussion in class, we concluded this shared trait may possess a survival advantage seen in so many species. We also looked at how in and out groups provide a distant advantage. Um, this was during the latter half of the class where we looked at racial and cultural biases in humans by looking at neurobiology, the formation of stereotypes, implicit bias, and subsequent behavioral change through social environment. This human focus kind of helped draw in all the ideas we discovered in class. The discussion-based format was also really productive because it let people share their personal experiences and ideas and also kind of helped students build off each other. Um, so like, for example, one student talks about Black women dying more in childbirth due to medical bias, which people were then able to kind of link and build upon and connect to racial disparity in COVID deaths. Um, it really opened my eyes to how our own behaviors can be seen in like wild animals and it's really important to be aware of our own innate biases to ensure we are behaving in ways to prevent them. Um, I really liked how this class incorporated information specific to ecology, but also made us more aware of social issues. I think this is something a lot of kind of majors could learn from and benefit by incorporating these themes. It also made me realize through some of the research projects we did at the end of the semester, the sheer amount of online data that exists and how this data can be used to better understand social issues and prevent them from occurring in the future. After taking this class, Dr. Z asked me to be a TA for her upcoming EEOB 3498 course. She chose to transition the labs to online and keep the lectures in person. The online labs really were lacking in student participation and engagement. I don't know if maybe the pandemic just left a lot of students kind of displaced, burnt out, overwhelmed. But whatever reason, we knew it was not working out. So it made the TAs and Dr. Z realize we needed to change if this class is going to be successful in the future. So I will let Jessica take over then. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to share my screen real quick because I've got some slides here. Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Give a thumbs up from somebody. Okay. You guys can hear me okay? Okay. Great. So before I forget, let me also quickly share the link to my slides for those who want to follow along. Um, okay, so thank you, Fauna. Thank you to everyone for participating in our session today. My name is Jessica Henderson, and I'm an instructional designer within the College of Arts and Sciences Office of Distance Education. Um, and today I'm going to share with you some of the EEOB asynchronous virtual lab examples that we've created that demonstrate how we are attempting to rethink and reimagine these online components of the course um, as we work to overcome the challenges, some of the, the challenges around engagement and access that, that Fauna just briefly mentioned. So um, let me go to my second slide here. By the end of the presentation segment, um, my hope is that you will gain a sense of how universal design for learning principles can serve as a guide in the transformation of course content, improving engagement, accessibility, and inclusion how accessible tools that have been approved by the university can be strategically employed to recruit student interest and build understanding, how you might consider employing interactive content in your own courses, and finally, where you can go to find some additional resources regarding H5P and how to get started turning new ideas into beneficial interactive course components. So that's sort of my agenda. Um, for the sake of time, I had a couple examples on here to sort of gauge your reactions because a lot of what we're talking about in terms of the content are sort of step-by-step -step instructional guides. Um, and so I can just show you a few examples here that are uh, you can give some reactions to, but things that you've probably seen in your everyday life. So this is a user manual of a DVR remote um, that shows a lot of text with very few images. And a second example here is just pure images with, with little to no text. So feel free to submit your reactions when you see sort of instructional guides like this. Um, my own reaction, I tend to like the visuals, but you know, this is not the best example from Ikea if you've seen these before. Lots of optical illusions, very hard to follow. Um, this one I would probably just throw in the trash and break my TV before, you know, dealing with this. So that would be my reaction. But um, these are just sort of examples to give you a sense of what we do not uh, want to strive for when we're creating these step-by-step -step processes. Um, 
And so, because uh, they, they employ very few, if any, of the suggestions that are pr proposed by Universal Design for Learning Framework, which, which is a framework based on scientific evidence about how humans learn. And these guidelines really offer concrete suggestions and examples to help improve teaching and learning across disciplines. Um, and their goal is really to help ensure that learners of all backgrounds have access to learning opportunities and that they can participate in meaningful ways. And so because of the nature of this presentation, I'm not going to go into UDL2 specifically, but I have highlighted a couple of the key principles that we really focused on when creating this content that I'm about to show you. Um, and if you are interested in reading more details about the UDL framework and specific suggestions, I have the link included on the slide. So you're welcome to sort of go in and dive in there. But I want to get to the specific EEOB asynchronous lab content. Um, and a large portion of the online labs consist of group discussions about required readings um, of articles that they've done ahead of time, as well as task-based assignments that follow content that was previously learned in class or that they have to learn within the virtual lab sections of the course. And these latter instances in which students are learning content on their own, generally how to access and use various features of an educational research tool to complete a given task, are really where we focused most of our efforts. And so here on the slide that's on my screen, I've included a few examples of what some of the previous instructional guides um, that were provided to students during the virtual labs looked like. So these instructions were provided to students in the form of downloadable Word documents containing a combination of text instructions and screenshot images. And so those initial examples that you saw, this kind of falls somewhere between the two, right? We've got a little bit of multimodal representation with a little bit of text and some images, but there's still a lot of room to, to grow and expand um, access and engagement with these. And so with these opportunities in mind um, and our college's recent acquisition of H5P, we had a chance to really think outside the box and create something that would be both appealing and accessible to students. So for those that aren't familiar with H5P, it is an online platform that allows for the creation of a range of interactive content and activities such as interactive presentations and books, virtual tours, interactive videos, and other types of content that can all contain various forms of media, as well as assessment questions that can provide useful and immediate feedback to students. So I've got a couple examples I want to show you here. Um, this first example that I wanna share guides students through a step-by-step -step process for creating a story map in ArcGIS, or ArcGIS, which is a geospatial analysis tool that's used within the class. Because this task is a sequential one that contains a long list of steps, I decided to utilize the, um, the interactive presentation content type really to chunk information into smaller digestible components through which students can move at their own pace. So this content type allows me to easily incorporate alternative forms of information such as text, video, and images without overwhelming the slide, without um, overwhelming the learner cognitively. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this example here. And hopefully you can all still see my screen and you see some new slides now. Great. Okay, so um, in this example, the first thing I wanna point out is they're the sort of range of navigation features that allow students to take different pathways with how they interact with the, with the content, right? So standard slides, we can use the arrows to move back and forth, you know, one side at a time. But we've also got this sidebar and um, the menu feature here that allows students to jump to specific content. So it, maybe they forget how to embed a website link in this ArcGIS platform. They can come back to this presentation and go specifically to that slide and that content later in the semester, because this is a tool that they are using um, throughout the semester when it's employed. Um, and then we've also incorporated an additional navigation feature with the buttons here that really sort of prompt the students for the next step that they should be taking if they're doing this for the first time. So these buttons just help sort of follow that sequential order. Um, on the second slide, I can't see my button here, um, but we've got some initial instructions that, um, sorry, hold on, my audio is, I can't, there we go, now I can turn it on. Um, so <laughs> this instruction guide is really to give that, because this is likely the first time that they're seeing H5P content, we wanted to also set them up to be able to use this tool. So we provided 
sort of a, a navigational instruction guide to help them, you know, understand how to navigate through the content, what the various buttons are that they're going to be seeing and how they should be interacting with them. Um, I've also got both audio instructions here that can be turned on and off, as well as text instructions for those who prefer text over sort of that auditory format. So that is what that one's there for. Um, I'll kind of skip through this slide. Most of the slides are breaking down the step-by-step -step processes. And so we've chunked sort of that text information into smaller groups and then incorporated screenshots into these buttons that can be minimized so that for those who you know, don't like to look at visual information or maybe it overwhelms them, they don't have to view it unless they really want to. And it just is a way to provide some of that additional information. The same with sort of supplementary text information, we can minimize those things that aren't essential to complete the step, but still offer additional guidance should it be needed. Um, and so you're welcome to click throughout and you'll see a lot of those different features as you go through these steps here. And then the last side of this example really is just a way to confirm to the students that you've completed all of the steps required um, and giving them some guidance as to where they should go from here. So that's what that last one was really for. Um, I'm gonna jump back to my initial slides here. The second example that I've included, I don't have time to go over in depth. It's very similar to the first, but the biggest difference is that it removes a lot of those uh, navigation features and instead utilizes links to allow students to jump between slide content so that they can really, again, heighten that sense of student choice and exploration uh, because, again, the sequential process isn't as important in this example. So, again, I encourage you to sort of look through that one on your own time. But I really want to end with this other example, um, which is a guide to working with SAS Studio, which is a primary tool that students use in these courses to run and analyze statistical analyses. So again, it's something that they have to use throughout the course. And for this example, I utilized the interactive book content type in H5P because this content here was sort of naturally divided into key categories and functionalities that each had some lengthier step-by-step -step instructions. And so I'm gonna open this example really quickly. Can you see this new example now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the interactive book functions more like a website. So instead of the slides that move sort of side to side, this one is scrolling up and down. Um, it's got navigation menus so you can jump to key content or segments of the book. Um, and so the, the key with this one was really, again, we want to avoid that over, you know, avoid cognitive overload. So trying to chunk information to uh, avoid that extensive scrolling up and down and keeping things contained. So really with ex this example, instead of including lengthy text by text instructions, we've incorporated video tutorials that also have the text transcripts again. So again, providing those multi means of, of representation that students can choose how they interact with the content. Um, but the key thing, feature that I wanted to point out with this one is that we've also been able to incorporate some assessment checks, particularly with some of the more complicated tasks in using SAS and the, the programming code pieces. And so this just sort of gives students a way to reflect and make sure that they've understood some of these more difficult aspects, as well as a way to, you know, come back later in the semester. And if they've forgotten the specific code they need to run, you know, their report, they can always check themselves by coming back to this guide here. So those are sort of the two main examples that I wanted to quickly run through. Um, before I turn it over to Eleanor, because I want to make sure she's got enough time, uh, I just wanted to point out that, so these examples were all created in H5P, which is an external tool from Carmen, but because the tool has been fully vetted and approved at Ohio State for security and accessibility, we are able to integrate this content directly into Carmen. And so that ability to embed content within pages, surround it with additional text, has additional benefits in terms of engagement and accessibility. Um, some things of which I've listed on the slide here that again, you can sort of reference later. Um, but I also just want to end by saying that going forward, we still have some work to do to finalize the labs um, and gather feedback from students. We haven't yet had a chance to fully employ them. So we're very excited to see what students actually think when they get their hands on these. Um, and our other big hope is to make this content more broadly available, especially to the community of high school students who the TAs of this course mentor through research projects, which I think Eleanor is going to discuss a little bit of next. Um, but really quickly before I give it to her, I just wanted to point out that I did list on the slide, again, some additional 
resources that we have about H5P, um, some examples of the different ways that it can be used and who you can go to to work with it. And just for some fun interactive piece on your own, you can also uh, sort of take a minute to reflect on the examples that you've seen and, and decide whether or not you want to use it and get some immediate feedback there. But with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Eleanor, who's going to finish off. Hello. Okay, so hi, my name is Eleanor McDonald. I am an undergraduate student in the department of EEOB. Similarly to Fauna, I was a student in Dr. Z's entering independent research class and a TA for her course, undergraduate research in behavioral ecology. So switching gears a little bit, I'm going to be discussing our lab's online research activities and outreach with high schoolers in the community during the pandemic. So as some of you may be aware, start to finish research projects are often long and hard to come by, especially as a high school student. And with limited time and often a lack of transportation, many high school students will go without any kind of research experience, that is until they enter college. And so it can really be difficult for students in high school to have a good understanding of what research in college might look like for them and to see if it, it's something that they would potentially enjoy taking part in. And it's also dif often difficult for many people in academia as well who have very busy schedules and have little time to afford mentorship to high schoolers. So research, research experiences have been even more difficult to come by during the pandemic, um, especially at the height of the pandemic as I've experienced myself as an undergraduate researcher. When I was first reaching out to labs to get involved, many labs that were conducting in-person research were understandably not able to safely bring on new students, and many research opportunities were put on hold. So another thing that we've seen since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic has been this huge transition into online learning. And this has really created a space to build connection and mentorship um, for us with high school students in the community that are interested in research and have reached out to our lab. So currently I'm mentoring a high school student who has expressed interest in learning about just the research process in general. And online learning has really facilitated and expanded the scope of what he's been able to do. So we're currently working on a start to finish research project investigating patterns of whale movement and sea ice extent in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. And we are attempting to answer really novel research questions using data from multiple different sources that has already been collected, such as satellite data and data from other online resources. So using data from previous studies is you know, a common method in research and has been really a great alternative method to analyze data that does not require the student to be in person or collecting the data themselves. And it's also really a valuable skill to learn about resources for research, as well as what other researchers are doing in your particular field of interest. So mentoring from an online platform has allowed my mentee to learn new technical skills, both with me and with Dr. Z, as well as on his own time from his own home without any of us having to worry about commuting uh, to the other with flexible meeting times, you know, not having to worry about getting from one place to the other because it's all able to be done virtually. And we've really had the chance to discuss what a research project looks like from start to finish, including the scientific method, how to formulate research questions, hypotheses, predictions, as well as the methods that can be used for carrying out his analyses, all from the safety of his own home. Um, and as of now, he's really obtained a good idea of one, how difficult obtaining data for research really can be, and two, how as research scientists, we need to change direction based off of our available resources. And these skills that he's acquired in searching for data and developing a research proposal are really incredibly valuable to have as a high school student and something that I wish I would have had as a high school student as well. And really, it's just been a truly rewarding experience to mentor a high school student on this project. And my experience has shown that, you know, mentorship that is facilitated through online communication can be a great way to pay it forward and elevate the young people in our community that are expressing interest in research. 
So thank you all so much for listening to our presentation. We really appreciate you showing up. And at this time, we will take any questions that you may have. Feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll also be posting our emails if we do not have enough time for, uh, to get to all of the questions. So thank you. I think we have time to, to do one question before transitioning to the next um, panel. Um, if anyone has one, they want to uh, post in the chat and otherwise, um, yeah, panel, if you could post your emails um, in there in the chat for everyone who might want to reach out, that'd be great. So I think I can answer Elizabeth's question in terms of student feedback. We, um, Vincent, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of the plan is to employ some of them in the summer course, if I'm not mistaken, or at least the next one that's going to incorporate ArcGIS. But primarily, we have um, just been able to test it a little bit on some work study students who have had very positive reactions to it, especially after seeing sort of what the previous content looked like. And I know that um, both Fauna and Eleanor had a chance to walk through it, and they got to experience the previous content as well. And I don't know if you guys want to share sort of your reactions to it, since you are the ones who you know would have been using it. Yeah, I, I can definitely um, kind of touch on that. So... So Fauna and I both um, were TAs and we're trying to convey this information in an online format to um, oftentimes just, you know, blank screens. <laughs> um, and I'll say that this component with the walkthrough and, you know, the images and everything is just like so much more engaging than um, what our classes or what our experiences as TAs have been, uh, because this allows the student to go through it on their own time and go back to different parts that they maybe didn't understand as well, that they might not be as um, vocal about if they were just going through it um, on a Zoom class with other people. They might not be like, oh, actually, I didn't understand that, uh, that last part. Could you go back? So this really affords them the opportunity to go back and fully comprehend the material. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be great for the students that, that get to use it. Yeah, I feel like as a student, most of my learning, at least, is usually outside class. The easiest way to learn how to really use, especially like more complex software, is usually on your own time. And it's really nice to have those resources there. And so just like searching through Google, trying to find YouTube videos. I know often learning new software, that's kind of what happens. There's only so many resources then office hours and stuff can only do so much. And sometimes just being able to like see it already written out, you can fast forward, you can pause. It's, it's really convenient. All right. If, if you have any other questions or follow up for um, the first panel, please um, um, find their emails in the chat and reach out. Um, let's pivot now to the second panel, uh, teaching anatomy remotely during a pandemic, challenges and innovations in facilitating knowledge connections. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, uh, Chris. And thanks everybody for uh, coming and Dave for uh, organizing this uh, part. Can you make the slides the presentation mode? Okay. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, you can hear my uh, tornado alarm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, Jeff already, uh, Dave already read our session, but uh, my colleague gonna go over the housekeeping here. Yeah. So just in case you haven't turned on live captioning. Uh, you can do it on your Zoom bar by clicking on live transcript and then show subtitle. Uh, we, may, uh, we may not get to breakout room, but in case we do, uh, live captioning is available in breakout room and you're able to self-select. If you would like to, uh, like to have uh, our slides that you're seeing today, uh, please contact one of us. Uh, and also, for the interest of time, uh, please save your questions until the end or submit them in chat. Uh, one of us might be able to answer your questions in chat. Hello again, everyone. I am Nong in Panbut, uh, and I, I am a team leader for this course. Oh, now I have uh, sirens here. And a professor of veterinary anatomy uh, at the College of Veterinary Medicine. I would let my colleague uh, introduce themselves here. 
Hello, my name is Jay Xiao. Uh, I was previously an instructional designer at the College of Veterinary Medicine, and now I am an instructional technologist uh, with the Office of Technology and Digital Innovation. Hi, I'm Chris Frazier, and I'm an instructor uh, with Dr. M. Pan Butte in the Department of Veterinary Biosciences uh, at the College of Vet Medicine at Ohio State also. All right, thank you. And here is the list of our esteemed uh, team, teaching team members. Dr. Masti, Dr. Reddish, Dr. Ricewick, and Dr. Marta. Next, please. So the session outline here, we're gonna include with the, I'm gonna give you an overview of the course. And then my colleague gonna take on uh, with the, how we transition from teaching 100% in person to 100% online in the autumn 20. If you think back about uh, March that we were told uh, to go home. And um, so since then, uh, our team met regularly uh, for three and a half months, uh, weekly one and a half hour uh, to uh, try to discuss and find a way how we can teach this course uh, effectively. And then uh, my uh, colleague, Chris, going to take over on showing you how we then uh, move back to the uh, hybrid in autumn 21. Next, please. So the session outcome here, outcomes here, I hope that uh, we can reflect how our lessons learned can be applied to your own. And we also would like to hear you share your experiences, the strategies that you use that effective so we can learn and take it back to our course. Next, please. An overview of this course. Next. So anatomy is the, the gross anatomy is the, um, this course is for the first year veterinary student. We set them up for success, hopefully. And uh, it is a foundation for our uh, veterinary education and medical education as well. It introduces the anatomical structures and function, facilitates the appreciation of the 3D. So this is very important here, which I'm going to detail uh, later on why it is very important. And then it typically was delivered hands-on uh, before the pandemic, which is uh, mean that we always have the dissection laboratory. Next, please. So this course, we use uh, dog as a model. Uh, approach by regional. Regional mean, you know, we go by a limb, uh, head, thorax, abdomen, for example. And then each session at the end, we have the case study to show students to apply the knowledge uh, into the clinical setting. It's a big class, 165 students uh, with us seven in instructors. And it's a face-to-face -face, uh, delivery, as I said. So a three and a half credit hours. Uh, let's move to the next slide. I'm going to show you how uh, the setting was and thought. So in the left uh, screen here, uh, this is the lecture hall that we uh, can have an 165 students uh, all at once. Uh, this is mean in the previous pandemic. And then after one hour of lecture, we move into the dissection laboratory on the right screen. You can see that there would be four students per one uh, dog uh, in each table, and they would dissect and identify the structures and learn, apply the knowledge from what they learned from the uh, lecture into the lab. Next, please. So in the next uh, two slides here, I'm going to warn you that we'll have some dog cadavers. Uh, so for those of you who know you cannot stand it, Next, please. On this one, I want to show you why the appreciation of the three-dimensional complexity is important. Imagine uh, students learn from text from the lecture, and then they have to translate that text into the visual image. So the, uh, the visual image on the uh, left, uh, the diagram here, this is how they then take it to the next level, to the middle uh, column, middle uh, picture here, which is the dissected image on the relationship of structures to each other. For example here, why the relationship 
is very important is that they have to apply their knowledge uh, when you do the clinic of the relationship, when you open the abdomen, when you look and find that this is the duodenum uh, right here, and then attached to it right here is the pancreas, which is this diagram, uh, a duodenum, and then pancreas. When you do surgery on the duodenum, the pancreas is there. So you have to be careful of whatever you do because they all are connected and related to each other. So that's a difficulty that students have to transition and visualize uh, the 3D image. And then they would apply this knowledge into the right screen, which is <laughs> all these noodles. They have to figure out, you know, uh, what is where. For example, they have to know this is the stomach here and this is the descending duodenum. And right here, then the pancreas. So that's why uh, it makes it difficult uh, for our students to learn besides the massive amount of materials for anatomy. They have to comprehend within one semester and then put things together in relationship. Uh, next slide, please, or next movie. So in this one here, just to show you, um, let's show our colleagues here the uh, movie. So just to show you when they open the uh, abdomen, uh, right here, this is the head. This is how all the things are put together in the abdomen. The relationship that they have to learn from the text and translate that into the real life. Um, so that's why it makes teaching uh, this class is quite difficult, challenging already before the pandemic. Uh, and now, uh, uh, yeah, that's good. Next, please. So from here, my colleague, Mr. Shao, going to take it uh, to how we move it to 100% after you saw the complexity a little bit uh, of this, how difficult it is. Okay, Jay, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so as Dr. Bambu mentioned, um, back in summer 2020, uh, when uh, we all were asked to start working from home and classes went off uh, online, uh, the doctor of veterinary medicine courses, uh, we all had to kind of think about how we redesign for a online delivery. Uh, so all the DVN courses had a required online backward design process. So going from your outcomes, your assessments, your content and your delivery and so on. Uh, we, uh, the DVN courses already used a standardized uh, Carmen template uh, that the Office of Teaching and Learning over at College of Med put together. And the template was updated to kind of fit online delivery a little bit better. So for example, we required the courses, uh, at least the core courses to adopt uh, modularized uh, design. Uh, and we also had uh, templates for, for example, assignment instructions, um, overview pages and whatnot, which uh, I'll show you here in a little bit. All the courses also went through a required quality assurance process, which was modeled after OAA's online course assurance process. As we were designing um, the course for online, we really paid attention uh, to how we can facilitate connections, which Incidentally, it's the thing of this conference, right? Um, that we know that a student's learning. So connections with the content, with the instructor, with their peers, uh, and also with the students themselves. So we want to, to highlight a couple of uh, high level changes. Uh, so for example, uh, didactic content delivery, which used to be done in in-person lectures, um, the course team worked together and redesigned them into self-paced and synchronous modules, which were posted uh, 72 hours prior to the start of each week. Uh, and that's also before their midweek synchronous session as well. Uh, so as a result, we were able to kind of expand the variety of materials provided to students. Uh, so now they include pre-recorded videos, slides, notes, and other additional resources. Students used to be able to kind of familiarize themselves and, uh, and apply 3D concepts in anatomy. Uh, and that used to be done in dissection labs. Uh, in the online setting, instead they were done as synchronous virtual labs. Uh, 
We also uh, made use of third-party models and in-house dissection videos and dissection, uh, dissected images. Whereas the students used to kind of get interaction with instructors and or peers in person uh, in the lecture and dissection lab setting, uh, they were transformed into synchronous sessions and labs in Zoom. Uh, and we injected active learning and group work opportunities. Uh, there's the sec uh, discussion boards in the course. And also there's optional office hours where students can meet with instructors and ask questions and guidance as needed. We were also able to expand our no or low stakes learning knowledge checks opportunities from just week, uh, weekly quizzes uh, to H5P activities, uh, clinical case questions. We also have weekly check-in and reflection surveys built into the Carmen template that kind of asked the students to check in with themselves what they learned that week, what worked well and what didn't work so well. Here's just some example screenshots. So on the left, you, you see that uh, template and module that takes students from overview of the module to exploration, core content application, and then some as, uh, assessment opportunities. And on the right side for overview pages, uh, students come here and take a look at what they're expected to learn, how much time each piece might take, and also what their learning outcomes for the module was. In an online setting, we know that students uh, lack that kind of uh, uh, resources and guidance and whatnot that they uh, can typically get from the instructors on a in-person uh, basis. Uh, so we also, when we updated the template, we also made sure that we uh, added uh, additional resources that students need to um, be successful, not only just uh, in the course, but specifically in an online setting. So at the end of the semester, uh, we kind of gave students a survey to kind of gauge what their feedback was. So in terms of what worked well, the top five items, uh, according to students' feedback, the course format, uh, as we uh, kind of show you a little bit in the last few slides, Students like the variety of low stakes uh, activities and formative assessments. They benefited from the narrative and dissection videos, and they appreciated how the teaching team worked together to kind of de design, develop, and deliver this experience for them. What didn't work well, students really wanted to be able to do dissection in the in-person dissection laboratory. Um, and they really wanted a return of that hands-on experience. And also we have some preliminary data that suggests that students have difficulty grasping 3D concepts and relationships between structures without that uh, in-person dissection laboratory experience. And next, I'm going to hand out to Mr. Chris Frazier to talk about how we took the lessons that we learned from the online delivery uh, back, in, uh, back to a hybrid design in Autumn 21. Okay, thanks, Jay. This is where we are now. So this is what we did in Autumn of 21. Um, and we, we kept our best asynchronous elements that worked well, and we implemented them into our hybrid design for this year. So what worked, work, what worked well? First, asynchronous modules and our learning materials were posted on Carmen before the start of the week. Um, if, it was, if the content was done earlier and was ready, then we put it on uh, Carmen for them uh, earlier so that they could start working through some of the content as, as they wished. We kept synchronous Zoom sessions for check-ins, for clarification of confusing material, and question and answer. And we also kept our formative assessment activities Jessica did such a great idea explaining what H5P was in her presentation. So you know what H5P is? Those are drag and drop activities for us for labeling. We kept our weekly quizzes uh, and et cetera. Next slide. We also enhanced our in-person synchronous experiences with our lessons learned. The students said that they wanted a dissection lab, so we brought back our dissection labs. And we also implemented a simulation-based active learning session. So, Half the class will be in either of these sessions concurrently, and those sessions then would be further divided into groups. So two groups from each station take turns leading and participating in shared cadaver dissection, and this necessitated planning and communications. So as one group was dissecting the lab, the other group was in the active learning area, 
and then they would switch halfway through our session. And as you can imagine, um, as the students that dissected went to the simulation area and the simulation area students went to the dissection lab, using a shared cadaver, this necessitated planning and communications between the groups. Next slide. So simulation-based active, active learning sessions, this happened in our new classroom. We have a new active learning classroom in our Spectrum of Care Clinic. And students would work in groups participating in these active learning exercises, such as building anatomical models, engaging in think, pair, share, and discussing clinical cases. Since this is active learning, this is learning that is done by the student in collaboration with their peers. Uh, faculty and instructors were there to facilitate and pay special attention to cognitive and effective stresses in the students and offer support and encourage students to check in with themselves cognitively and effectively. Next slide. So here's a sample of one of our simulators. Um, on the screen, you're looking at, on the computer screen, on the computer screen, on the desk, you're looking at a chest cavity of a dog. So you're looking at a heart there. I know it's kind of hard to tell, um, and maybe you wouldn't know what that looked like anyway. So I'm telling you, and so this student here on the table is building a model out of PVC pipe, some rope, and a tennis ball. So what this student is trying to build here uh, is a representation, a 3D representation without a specimen linking the path of the esophagus through the chest cavity in relationship to that of the trachea, which clinically is very important. The uh, tennis ball is a property of Dr. M. Pam Butte because she plays a lot of tennis. So we utilize those tennis balls as the heart. So as you can see, the student then built this model, which looks exactly like the chest cavity of a dog. Next slide. So let's revisit this design to facilitate these connections. Again, like Jay said, this is about connections. What do we wanna make connections with in our hybrid model? We want to make a connection with our content. We wanna make connections with our instructors because we could not do that when we were on the online, online format the same as we do when we're in person. We want to connect with our peers, and we also want to connect with, our, with uh, ourselves or themselves. Next slide. So here's an example of connecting with content. So more active learning opportunities. This is a module of, or a little uh, part of the class that's in the Active Learning Center. This is a group of students that's looking at a radiograph of the chest cavity on a digital screen in the uh, Spectrum of Care Clinic, our active learning classroom. And together, they're working through a case-based problem together so that they can um, facilitate an answer uh, outside of instruction and didactic teaching. Next slide. And we said we want them to connect with their peers and instructors, so their engagement in meaningful, facilitated group work. Here is the group of students that built the model, as you can see on the table. And if you look in the background there, um, the gentleman standing with the grayer hair and the uh, blue shirt is one of our colleagues, Dr. Reiswig, and he's there to facilitate uh, working with instructors as an on-need basis. We would float around the room and listen to the uh, students engage with one another, and then we would add our input as necessary. Next slide. And now, next, we'll talk about our takeaways and the entire team. Turn from view. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm muted. I was saying to myself, yeah. what did we learn? Um, teaching anatomy completely online was challenging, but possible. We adopt the best practices in teaching online, made the course itself more active and more effective, as you saw how we did. Uh, and then we reintroduce the in-person, which is that's what students want. The teaching online depends greatly on the teamwork because we have the whole team. But very importantly in the online teaching is technology. And luckily that we have Mr. Xiao, who is our co uh, collaborator, I mean, our team uh, presenter today, that without him, I would tell that this cause was not possible because we have been constantly in communication uh, with Jay uh, because um, it is so difficult. Everything is being posted online. So I cannot say uh, how much I am uh, grateful for uh, Jay, but sadly now the... Uh, 
OTDI stole him from us, Dave. <laughs> Complain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, please. Yeah, so I can speak to the first. Uh, so, what lessons do we learn? So, kind of as we mentioned uh, again, and again, um, uh, asynchronous setting is different from a in person, uh, in person uh, synchronous setting, right? So, like students, again, they didn't have that constant uh, connection with the. Uh, in-person opportunity to connect with the instructor for their uh, kind of serendipitous question and answering after class on the po at the podium and whatnot. So one of the things we definitely focused on was uh, the importance uh, to scaffold metacognitive skills, which for example, is thinking about thinking. So uh, planning, uh, scheduling, uh, study schedules, uh, checking with oneself to, to, to see how the learning is going and whatnot. And some students we know they lack uh, metacognitive, uh, metacognitive skills. So we really paid attention to facilitate those. Chris? Oh, uh, Chris, you're muted. Sorry, I, my camera was off earlier too. I'm just, just messing this all up. So now you can see me too. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. I apologize. Um, so one of the things that we all worried about with our students um, being in, in a format that was not in a traditional sense that we're used to teaching anatomy, um, we, we wondered um, how they would fare. And we realized that they were very resilient. Um, and we, I've told myself personally that there's no reason to ever underestimate the resiliency or their ability to adapt to changes and um, their ability to perform, which in medicine is uh, essential to their learning. Um, they need to be able to adapt and be resilient. Um, we fought, found that communication is very important in an online course, which is pretty obvious. Um, students uh, may feel isolated. I know a lot of our students felt when we were completely online, this sense of, you know, non, they didn't have any collegial input with somebody other than a computer screen. And we found that it helps their communication to be frequent and, and intentional. I know personally, I met with them individually as much as I could on Zoom. Um, and we also believe that communication between um, us as teachers is vital and important because throughout the design and development and delivery, it's, it's essential that we all uh, maintain uniformity across all our different um, disciplines that we teach because we all don't teach everything. Um, so we all want to try to keep some type of uniformity between the teams so that students don't struggle um, as we switch uh, teachers. Next slide. So we have planned a shared out time, uh, but in the interest of time, uh, uh, we do encourage you to kind of look at these questions and think about uh, think about them and uh, perhaps even share with us uh, through our email addresses if you're able. So how did you redesign your traditionally hands-on activities? What did you learn from emergency online teaching? And how will you incorporate the lessons learned as uh, restrictions uh, in terms of COVID and the pandemic began to ease? Dr. Um, yes, I think uh, we're going to go to the uh, end the slides uh, first, but I want to uh, thank the Innovate uh, team for organizing this meeting. I miss it, and I'm so happy to be here again. Our students are excellent when we taught online. They're just so understanding. And then the great teaching team that we had uh, without the team work, uh, this is not possible and the professional support uh, pro a team, which is like, this is just like our right hand, Jay and the, the, the Office of uh, Teaching and Learning for us, we cannot do without it. So thank you very much, the audience uh, that you uh, attend. And please share with us what you did that work. And I don't know, Dave, but I don't think we have time. <laughs>